Okay. Well, let's get going. So, in our last episode, what we accomplished was uh, leaping into our first additional bucket, beginning to see how the whole realm of sociobiologists, evolution of behavior last week, hits a wall when it comes down to, so where are the actual genes? And what we transitioned to on Monday was seeing the structure of actual genes and the classical dead-in-the-water version of all of it, which is micro-mutations, deletion insertion, uh, point mutations, microevolutionary change, and this whole world where one gene is followed by another by another. Latter half of Monday, what we did was completely trash the notion that genes know what they're doing, that genes are the centerpiece of life, that genes are the starting point for every every event in your cell built around making a protein. How does a gene know when to have some RNA made that's a template of it and then lead to a protein? The answer is a gene has no idea whatsoever. That transitioned us up to the astonishing point that 95% of DNA is non-coding. <clears throat> Implications there being the vast majority of DNA is not about genes. It's about the on-off switches for genes, the instruction manual. Our whole world of promoters, you will see in the extended notes that promoters hand in hand with that are repressor elements, the exact same concept, the opposite direction. What we've got from there is endless ways in which genes know squat about what's happening. The regulation of gene expression is by the environment, the intracellular environment, the extracellular environment, the real outside world world environment, all the ways in which you can't even begin to think about what a gene does outside the context of the environment that regulates it a point that I will return to obsessively and irritatingly for the rest of the course, do not overvalue the role of genes in and of themselves, certainly not in a deterministic way. So what we saw there was how flimsy the notion is of a gene being deterministic. Do not think of a gene, a DNA sequence, as having any sort of agency. It is just a template for the environment to get something to read off of it and then create a protein. What we also saw towards the end of Monday was another way in which the whole notion of genes as the holy grail and deterministic is being suspect. Not only this notion within any given cell, a gene, doesn't really know what it's doing, it's all regulated by environment, but this additional sense that the collection of genes you get from your parents by way of that fertilized egg that all of you once were, that collection of genes is not set in stone is not deterministic at that level either. Instead, that whole bizarre world we got of Barbara McClintock's genes jumping all over the place, not just in plants, not just in pathogens, not just in the immune system, but that totally bizarre finding that just when your brain's getting around to making new neurons, it does some of that transposes shuffling of genes. In other words, the part of your body that is most central to behavior, the cells in there have genes that have the least resemblance to what you got from your parents. Yet again, another blow from the notion of genes as deterministic, what you inherit as deterministic, weakening all of that. Okay, so that set us up for that first challenge there, which is to start getting you guys less and less impressed with the importance of genes per se. The second challenge now that comes out of this subject is to get back to that issue of gradualism versus punctuated change. Gradualism, everything we heard about last week, is dependent on gradualism. Every little bit of difference makes a difference. If you are one-eighth of a thousandth of a percent better at some behavior than the other individual, and you leave that many more copies of your genes over enough evolutionary time, that trait's going to be selected for this world of gradualism, and thus adaptationism. Ooh, every single thing out there exists due to evolution sculpting it because it was useful for you, this very gradualist view that says all the stuff from last week, all the competition, all the aggression, all the strategies, all the alternative strategies, all of those matter and all of them have been sculpted by evolution. In contrast, we had the starts of the challenge to it, the punctuated equilibrium model, saying instead, most of the time, 
there's stasis. Most of the time, there isn't change. Most of the time, what you have are little traits that pop up evolutionarily are not adaptive and not a thousandth of an inch more adaptive. Instead, they're spandrels. And instead, they're not terribly relevant until periods of very rapid selective pressure where it looks a whole lot different from this world. What's the implication here? All of that stuff where every smidgen of extra aggression and competition and adaptiveness and caginess doesn't make a difference at all. Now, what we saw on Monday was the whole world of point mutations, insertion, deletions, the micro evolutionary change world is exactly the engine for this sort of gradualism. This is this whole world where thanks to some amino acid changing, thanks to, say, some little point mutation or whatever, you now have a protein that's one thousandth of one percent better at what it does, and thus, obviously, you're going to leave more copies of your genes as a result, and that's, and that's the engine for gradualist change. And we saw in some cases that sort of micromutation could bring about some really not tiny gradualist subtle change. Instead, you've got phenylketonuria. Instead, you've got testicular feminization syndrome. Any of those where it's a big dramatic effect. But what we also began to see was this was a world where tiny little differences could make for benzodiazepine receptors that are a little bit better or a little bit worse at dealing with anxiety. And what we've transitioned to there is, forget diseases like PKU or testicular, we're talking about individual differences. We're not talking about mutations. We're talking about variability, normative variability in DNA sequences, variability where some versions are a little bit more adaptive than others, exactly the engine for this sort of stuff. Okay. So now what we need to do here is completely blow that picture out of the water as well. And for that, we need to transition to one additional feature of sort of the architecture of DNA, of chromosomes, of genes, that winds up being critical here. Okay, so what's the transition we made the other day? We went from the boring classical picture, gene, immediately the start, and the next one immediately start, instead to our world of here's a promoter for this gene. Here's a different promoter for that gene. These promoters are regulated by transcription factors, transcription factors which come along and do their whole lock and key deal and activate that. We know that from the other day. Next thing to deal with in terms of the architecture of genes, and this winds up being really important, as shown here. Okay, so we've now gotten as far as dealing with the notion that Okay, here's the gene, and you got this promoter upstream in this direction from it, regulating events there. All of that, we've got that down cold. Instead of one gene followed by another, another, the gene sits here by itself in this ocean of non-coding DNA. Now, here's what they figured out some decades ago, which is, for most genes, it's not a continuous stretch of DNA. Most genes are not coded in one long string of information. Instead, it's broken up into separate parts. Separate parts where there's bits of non-coding DNA in between. Broken into little individual parts. Jargon is the parts that are actually transcribed. The parts of the gene are called exons. And the intervening parts that are not transcribed are called introns. So introns and exons, jargon in the field, most genes are broken into multiple exons. And by definition, if a gene consists of X number of exons, it consists of X minus one number of introns in between, suddenly we've got this instead. Utterly boggling boggling and that right off the bat it generates a huge problem for you which along comes 
whatever your environmentally regulated transcription factor does its thing, turns on transcription of this gene. Transcription of the gene, you're going to stretch an RNA. Okay, we've had to deal with RNA. RNA is for real now, unlike earlier in this week. RNA is for real, and what we've got here is a strand of RNA, which is red. All RNA is red. And what we have corresponding to the blue are the parts that actually come from this gene. These are the stretches of RNA that are coded for by the exons that make up this gene. And in between is totally useless RNA that's coded for by the totally useless intronic DNA, the non-coding DNA. So you've got a strand of RNA now that is completely useless because it's not coding for what you want it to code for. What do you do? You need to come along and basically splice out the intron-derived RNA, stitch the pieces together, and there you have the actual gene worth of RNA's message. What do you need? And out of this came a whole new class of enzymes called splicing enzymes. What they do is they're able to sidle up to this RNA, RNA made of a combination of exonic and intronic-derived message, and cut out the intronic-derived one, stitch up the pieces together, and you've now got one continuous stretch of RNA, which then go codes for its protein down the line. Okay, this seems wildly, needlessly complicated. Why break up genes like this? Why do this sort of thing instead, where you've got to splice out and turn it into one gene? Who knows, yet another outcome of a committee meeting producing that sort of thing, but it winds up having a critical implication. And this is one that begins to allow us to evaluate this whole issue of gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium. Okay, so back to the broader view, in this case the non-molecular view, between these two different schools. So people who study behavior, who study neurons, who study hormones, things like that, would often wind up in the gradualist school. Where did these guys come from? As we heard last week, Stephen Jay Gould, this other guy, Niles Eldridge, these guys were paleontologists. These guys would do things like look at 100 million years worth of fossil records and see long, long periods of the fossils remaining the same, relatively rapid change, long stasis, punctuated equilibrium models, all of that punctuated equilibrium. The other term for the punctuated part is saltatory change, saltation. Those of you who have had kangaroos as pets will know that kangaroos saltate, leaping, hopping, action potential saltate down axons, and in this case, saltatory change, punctuated, and long periods of equilibrium. Aha, there's no resemblance at all to gradualism. And we heard last week the starts of what the rebuttals might be against that. First one, these are paleontologists. Paleontologists, their notion of rapid, saltatory, punctuated change, this is like three million years encompassed in here. Give me a break. You could evolve like seven new types of neurons during that length of time. That's what for a paleontologist is a blink of an eye, is plenty enough time for gradualist stuff to go on. Next response to these guys. Again, what do paleontologists study? They study all the boring stuff. They study the shapes of things, what the bones look like, what the fossils look like. You tell me what's interesting about the shape of a bone when you want to make sense of the evolution of behavior. Well, a little bit, we saw with the two skulls the other day. But for the most part, not the interesting stuff. What these people study, by definition these folks would say defensively, is all the boring stuff that tells you nothing about what's interesting. You can have a fossil go for 100 million years and not change, and you've completely developed a new type of brain in there and new types of behavior. They're missing the boat. They're not seeing the good stuff. Finally, what would be the strongest rebuttal is, well, show me some molecular mechanisms that would explain stasis and punctuated change. Show me mechanisms for macro evolutionary change rather than the micro evolutionary stuff we've got there from classical micro mutations. So that was the basic fight going on there. 
and sort of all the gradualist people would talk about these people looking at these sudden jerky changes and refer to the punctuated equilibrium people as being jerks. And these folks would refer to the gradualists as being creeps. Get it? Like jerks and creeps and, oh, science. What could be better? Okay, so this contrast, what would be molecular mechanisms to explain something as outlandish as very rapid, exciting change? And now we come to this, where this begins to come in. So... What's this good for other than making life a whole lot more complicated and producing this incessant sort of point of anxiety in people like me of is the exon the thing that transcribes or is the intron? And I always have to sort of keep that straight and this confused generations of people. But why break up genes this way? A guy named Wally Gilbert got the Nobel Prize for a DNA sequencing technique back in the 70s was the first one to realize what this allowed you to do you if you happen to be a gene. So, here we have a gene in Monday's boring version of it, which is, it's in three parts here, but it's continuous, and it's got the blue domain, the red, and the green domain. And what we see next is the much more realistic picture. This gene is actually coded for by three separate exons. So, suppose you had all sorts of cool, interesting, varied, multi-talented splicing enzymes, the ones that would look just like scissors and come along and splice the fat. Well, suppose you've got a whole bunch of different types of splicing enzymes that spliced with different patterns. So you've got this gene made of three exons, once you get out of the way the possibility if you don't do any gene expression at all, if instead you can start having different types of splicing enzymes, you could produce seven different outcomes. You could produce A alone, B alone, C alone, AB, AC, BC, ABC. You could produce seven different proteins with just this. What does that require you to have to pull that off? a gene with this exon-intron architecture, and different types of splicing enzymes. And suddenly, what you have is the potential for combinatorial generation of multiple messengers from the same precursor gene. Suddenly, you have the possibility of one gene specifying seven different proteins. And Wally Gilbert was then the first one to say, what this gives you is amazing versatility. What this also gave people immediately was this huge crisis of, so what exactly is the definition of a gene? We've had this definition that's been straightforward and simple forever, which is a gene is a stretch of DNA that specifies the construction of one protein. So suddenly, centuries of people knowing this constitutes one gene, okay, one gene now broken into three. Instead, is this thing seven genes? Is this one gene with multiple splice versions? That's begun to explain why we've got like 20,000 genes in our genome, and we have easily 100,000 different types of proteins. You're, junk, you're pumping out all sorts of different versions. All you need to be able to do is, and here's the jargon, alternative splicing. Splice with different patterns under different circumstances. And this is precisely where you see stuff like this coming in, profiles of different splicing enzymes in different parts of the body. For example, there's this huge whopping protein, rather gene, that's found called POMC, pro-opio-melanocortin. Do not write that down. The whole point of POMC is it's this massive gene with all sorts of exons. And by now, people are seeing genes with 10, 20, 30 exonic separate divisions in it. Hugely complicated. So the POMC gene has lots and lots of exons. And it turns out, if you snip and cut in certain ways in the anterior pituitary, you pull out a subsection of that and you produce a hormone called beta endorphin. That's nice. 
Meanwhile, over in another part of the pituitary, there's completely different splicing enzymes. And what they do is mix and match different exons from there, and they come up with a completely different hormone from there, something called melanocyte-stimulating hormone. Somewhere else, you splice it differently in the adrenals, and instead of beta endorphin, you get gamma endorphin, which does something differently. You've got all this combinatorial stuff. What does this require? different profiles of these splicing enzymes in different parts of the body, in different cell types, at different points in life, suddenly you have this huge, huge ability to generate vast amounts of variability. So that's great. That's great, but you now have all sorts of problems that come in. Built around, well, so what happens when you start having evolutionary change going on? critical thing to start making all of this much more complicated now. So, back to Monday's model. So here we have this gene, and here's its promoter, and we know there is its transcription factor somewhere out there that has whatever rules it has for when to get activated. Transcription factor A comes to promoter A and activates gene A. It turns out, instead, that one transcription factor can regulate the activity of scads of different genes, of dozens, of hundreds of different ones. Ah, the same promoter can be found upstream of all sorts of different genes. In other words, one transcription factor can not only turn on the activity, the expression, the transcription of one gene, it could turn on an entire network of genes. One example of that, a transcription factor called NF-kappa B. Don't write that one down either. And what NF-kappa B does is it interacts with a promoter, a promoter found in a gazillion different genes in certain cells in your immune system. What does NF-kappa B do? It turns on inflammation, the inflammatory response. For those of you sort of who've had some immunology with its cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines, All sorts of cytokine genes have promoters upstream that respond to NF-kappa B. This turns on not a gene, but a whole network of genes. So one transcription factor can now be affecting what's going on with a whole bunch of genes. Meanwhile, other complication... Orange. Time to use orange in this class. Meanwhile, the flip side of the same complexification here, which is one gene doesn't have just one promoter upstream of it. One gene can have a whole bunch of different promoters. In other words, the same gene can be activated by all sorts of different transcription factors. In other words, the same gene can be part of multiple different networks. So, we have just had a ghastly exponential increase in the complexity of all of this in terms of one transcription factor turning on multiple genes, one gene being regulated by multiple transcription factors, and every single one of these genes now beginning to show the potential with the right location, the right alternative splicing tools available of generating a whole array of different genes. Okay, so you could go do the math. If instead you've got four uh, exons, how many different variants can you get? What's the equation? Two to the fourth minus the number of thumbs you have on your left foot or something. But suddenly you get, if you got four of them, you got uh, more than seven. And if you got five of them, you got more than more than seven, just this huge, massive exponential increase. And by the time you got genes with 10, 20, 30 different exons making up the gene, staggering potential for complexity of genes that are being activated by multiple different transcription factors that are part of different networks, you see where things are getting a whole lot messier here. Even messier now, you begin to see things like some transcription factors will have their effect if and only if something is or isn't happening at another transcription factor nearby. Oh, my God, there's crosstalk between them. How's this for awful? 
and I still have refused to sort of deal with this as a reality, but here we have, no, we don't have it, so we've got a black marker. Okay, so here we have Okay, so we've got our whole world of this gene, and next promoter, next gene, and this gene happens to have more than one promoter. Where is the other promoter? What people are now realizing is the other damn promoter, which now is orange, this other promoter is sitting somewhere in an intron of the next gene up there. Or it's even further upstream than the promoter up here, or it's 17 genes over that way. How could that possibly be? Because DNA bends... So you've got all sorts of twirly stuff going on. And here's the promoter here, this huge long-distance one for the gene over here because it's right near. All this spatial stuff is going on. This is completely crazy. Look at the complexity you are now beginning to generate. So we've got these massive networks of regulation by the environment networks of one transcription factor, multiple genes, one gene, multiple transcription factors, intersection of the two. This massive complexity here of multiple end products. You could produce multiple proteins from the same gene. And this stuff matters. Okay, so what happens now when we introduce the possibility of mutations? Mutations on this level, not Monday's point mutation and deletion, and I now will do this, I will not do this, that sort of stuff. Now what happens when we start dealing with mutations in this whole additional world we've been getting here? What we have are all sorts of different means by which you can amplify signals, amplify genetic information. What do splicing enzymes do, they allow you to amplify what would otherwise be one gene into a whole bunch of different protein messages. An exon allows you to amplify this stretch of DNA popping up in a whole bunch of different proteins. That same deal again, promoters, multiple promoters, same promoter, multiple... Okay, all this network amplification stuff. So what happens if you start having mutations? What happens, for example, if you have a mutation in some splicing enzyme? What's that going to do? So suppose you have this gene with these three exons, and it just happens that in the entire universe, the splicing enzymes exist only for generating this, 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 and this form. That just happens to be the splicing enzymes that exist now, thanks to a mutation in one of those splicing enzymes, suddenly you make a completely novel protein, a protein that never existed before. Or thanks to that splicing enzyme having the mutation, you never make this protein again. We have suddenly jumped from Monday's boring world of, oh, get one gene with a slightly different shape, and instead of having like a penis, you have a vagina or something, oh, (laughs) not a biggie. Now, suddenly we have shifted from this world of mutations, changing the shape of a protein, and thus to mutations, causing the creation of totally novel proteins, or the total elimination of certain proteins. Not because, ooh, the protein that's made is so screwed up thanks to the mutation it doesn't work, a la PKU. The protein is never made because the RNA is never... This simply is never created anymore because you've had a mutation in the splicing enzyme that would normally make this, and instead it makes this. So now we've just seen in a world in which we start having mutations in splicing enzymes we're beginning to amplify. Instead of changing the way a pre-existing protein functions, we now have the potential to invent entirely new proteins or to eliminate types of proteins entirely. So big consequences there, potentially a 
macro evolutionary change, I say with dramatic foreshadowing. Okay, note that when we're talking about mutations here in these splicing enzymes, we're not talking about anything fancy. It's Monday all over again. This is a splicing enzyme because it's an enzyme. It's coded for by a gene, and that gene has the plain old boring. It's had a point mutation, a deletion, an insertion, all of that for Monday. And thanks to that, this splicing enzyme works a little bit differently. And instead of holding on to testosterone for three microseconds longer or shorter, that's now instead it works a little bit differently and snips in a different place. So the same microevolutionary mutations as Monday with something, an amplifying element like a splicing enzyme, and because this protein works a little bit differently, you generate an entirely novel protein. Or one that used to exist disappears completely. Okay, so that's one world now where Monday's classical types of mutations produce some macro, macro implications here. Next type. So suppose you've got a mutation here in one of your exons. So back to Monday, we've got some mutation. It could be a point. It could be a deletion. It could be an assertion. If it's a point, maybe it's of no consequence at all. It's a neutral one, that redundancy in the DNA code. Maybe it does make a difference. Maybe it's disastrous. Maybe it just modifies function, all of that. So that's fine. In this world, we saw how this could or couldn't produce some major implications. Now, because it's occurring in an exon, Suppose this is the type of point or insertion or deletion that does have a major implication. What's the major implication of that major implication? You're going to change the function of four different proteins. A mutation in one exon now amplified in its consequences into a whole network of proteins. And what we begin to see here now is no, I got the colors backward, is if it's a type of mutation that changes how that one exon, you may have just invented four new types of proteins. You may have just eliminated four types. You may have invented two new types, changed the function of a third one, and eliminated a fourth. All that's critical here is you're amplifying the consequences. So a micro mutation potentially with some macro consequences. And you could smell more and more how we're beginning to get into mechanisms for these huge changes here. Next example, promoter. So now you have a mutation in a promoter. Point, deletion, insertion, any of that stuff. Is that going to code for a different protein? No, not at all, because promoters don't code for anything. They're non-coding, back to Monday, all of that. What happens now instead is maybe the old transcription factor can't recognize it anymore. So now this transcription factor could never turn this gene on again. Maybe, thanks to this mutation in this promoter, a completely different transcription factor activates it. What have you done now? You could shift a gene. It's going to be the same protein, same shape, same function, blah, blah. But now, thanks to the promoter having a mutation, it's expressed now in a different network. It's expressed under different circumstances of environmental triggers, the same boring old protein, but in a completely different context. Another mechanism for amplifying huge consequences there. Next, now we've got instead of mutation in a transcription factor. Transcription factor, just like splicing enzymes, they're proteins, which means they're coded for by a gene. All of that, so you can have a mutation in a transcription. And the same deal all over again, boring classical point insertion deletion. And suddenly, you've got a transcription factor that interacts with a completely different promoter. Or it fails to interact with this old boring promoter. And what have you got again? You're not creating a new type of gene. You're creating a circumstance, a different circumstance, in which the old gene is expressed. So we've got a bunch of mutations here that could generate entirely novel proteins. Nothing like that in Monday's classical world of microevolutionary change. We've got a world in which a mutation can be felt in scads of different proteins. 
again, an amplification effect. We've got a world here in which mutations won't change the nature of any gene out there of any protein, but it will dramatically change the regulation of it, the context in which it is activated, and all of these are ways of potentially massively amplifying the consequences. Okay, let's look at a couple of examples of that. First one, there is a whole story that we're going to hear about when we get to the sex lectures, sex and affiliation and bonding and all of that, having to do with this sort of like parable of there's these two different types of vole species. And if you're from this world, all you do is glory over this research about these. One of them is called the mountain vole, and the other is called the the plains vole or the grassland vole or something or other. I never remember which is which, but they are two dramatically different voles. It's dramatically different as, oh, I don't know, District 12 and District 1. Okay, enough of that already. Okay, my goal is to make some reference to it. Every So you've got this dramatic contrast between mountain voles and and prairie voles. And what's the difference? And here's where I can't remember which one is which. One of them is your basic polygamous species, and males show up and mate, and then they disappear, and they're nomadic, and they're tournament species. And and the other, they pair bond for life. They pair bond for life. They, They stand up for each other. They die in each other's arms in their old age, that sort of thing. They, As we'll see, they don't actually pair bond that much for life. But nonetheless, on a first pass, they pair bond for life. So you've got a contrast that a vole species in which there is polygamy, where there's a tournament species, versus a closely related one where there's pair bonding. So what's the difference? What's the genetic difference? And it winds up, it has to do with a gene for a receptor, a receptor for a hormone called vasopressin. Vasopressin Don't worry too much about it right now, but we're going to hear tons about it. Vasopressin is released in different parts of the brain. It's also a hormone. Vasopressin, of necessity, doing its lock and key deal, acts through a vasopressin receptor. And vasopressin mediates something or other about feeling rewarded and feeling bonded and feeling affiliated with. So, what's the difference between the brains of the pair bonding ones and the polygamous voles? And it turns out it all has to do with the males, since they're the ones who are driving whether or not they stick around. What you see is, in the polygamous voles, when they mate, they secrete a little bit of vasopressin. Actually, they secrete a reasonable amount of it, and vasopressin has some effects throughout the brain by way of the vasopressin receptor. Meanwhile, what happens in the monogamous males? They mate, and they secrete the same vasopressin, and it just so happens they have vasopressin receptors expressed in a part of the brain that's all about reward, a part of the brain that has to do with a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Don't worry if you don't know about this yet. You will in about a month. Dopamine is all about pleasure. Cocaine works on dopamine systems. In other words... In the polygamous voles, they secrete vasopressin after mating, and it does nothing to these dopamine reward neurons because those neurons don't have vasopressin receptors. Meanwhile, in the monogamous voles, they mate, they secrete vasopressin, and these guys have vasopressin receptors in this reward dopamine part of the brain, and it activates the neurons there. And what happens in the sort of mechanistic brain of this little male vole there? He mates, and suddenly his dopamine pathways gets buzzed as a result, and he feels a sense of reward, and he says, ah, maybe I'll stick around and do that again. And thus he does, and thus is the building block of their magnificent, like, silver wedding anniversary somewhere down the line there. What's the difference? It's the fact that mating-induced vasopressin release activates these reward neurons in the monogamous bull males and doesn't in the polygamous males. And just to show how incredibly slick research can be these days, there was actually a study, a group, Larry Young at Emory University. What he did was he caused the dopamine neurons in polygamous males to express the vasopressin receptor gene when they normally don't. He manipulated them, a gene manipulation, to cause that, and he turned 
polygamous male voles into monogamous ones. Can you believe that? They expressed their feelings. They became good listeners, all sorts of stuff like that. A gene therapy, well, whether this counts as gene therapy, like curing the disease state of polygamous males or gene transfer is sort of open to discussion. But the main thing there is you throw a switch, get this receptor expressed in one part of the brain, and you completely change the social system of the species. So... Why in the polygamous males is the vasopressin receptor expressed in a different region than in the monogamous males? And what they went was they went and looked, and there's no mutation in the gene. The gene for the vasopressin receptor is identical in the polygamous and the monogamous. What's the difference? They have different promoters. The promoters differ by a couple of DNA letters there, minor difference. And what that winds up meaning is a transcription factor that's only found in those dopamine neurons works on that gene in the monogamous males, but not on the polygamous ones. So here we have, instead of a mutation in a gene, massive changes, a gene that transforms behavior, the gene's absolutely the same. What it's been is an evolutionary alteration in the context in which the gene is expressed, in the location where it's expressed, with a massive, massive implication for behavior. Okay, so another example of where this is relevant. Now we bring in another concept. Now what we have instead is, here's this gene, and here's its promoter. And in some individuals, they have the identical gene, and they have the identical promoter, but where they differ is they may have two copies of the promoter upstream from the gene. They may have 11 d copies. Oh, another level of regulation and variability. How many copies of the promoter do you find upstream? And suddenly, what you have is a world where the more promoter copies, the more transcription factors can come and activate it. More promoters equals more expression of the gene. And now there's research beginning to show in a world of rodents who show variability in how readily they get addicted to opiate-derived compounds, where you begin to see a difference. There's a whole opiate receptor system built around that, and you begin to see differing vulnerabilities to addiction as a function of how many copies of the promoter there are. Once again, no difference whatsoever in the genes themselves, differences in the regulation of them. And back to that paper I made reference to the other day, when you look at the genome of humans and the genome of chimps, and you look at where the differences are, 98% the same, where are the 2% differences, and what you see in terms of different DNA sequences, genes that have diverged from each other, a way disproportionate share of those genes code for transcription factors. So what we begin to see here is this transition from Monday's gradualist microevolutionary stuff of proteins that work a little bit better or a little bit worse, where now instead we have completely novel proteins, we have novel networks, we have novel contexts, novel amounts, all of that. All of these wind up being potentially macroevolutionary changes. Now, this brings us to the next one here. So, back to jumping genes, transposable genetic elements, Barbara McClintock stuff, that whole business the other day where sometimes whole stretches of DNA are copied and the copy is then stuck somewhere else. Some of the time, that's totally boring. What happened here, a copy was made of this promoter and the extra copy was inserted somewhere back when nearby. That's how you get multiplication, multiple copies of a promoter. The insertion here was very local. But what the transposes do is potentially take stretches of DNA that they've copied and plunk them into very different parts of the genome. That was the whole jumping gene business. So now, what sort of macroevolutionary changes can you get when you get mutations in the transposases? So let's take a five-minute break at this point, and we will see that because that's going to amplify in a completely novel way.
Okay, so in our process here of seeing all these different ways in which traditional little micro mutational point deletion insertion stuff now can produce huge amplificatory, amplificatory, huge consequences that amplify what we now see is even one step further in what you could do. What if you start getting mutations in the transposases, those enzymes that will do the jumping gene transposable genetic element Barbara McClintock stuff of making a copy of a stretch of DNA and plunking it down somewhere else entirely in the genome? One obvious thing. So now you've got some gene here, some exonic whatever, and suppose you get a transposase, which normally does not go after this stretch, but does, goes after this exon. And what it does is it makes a copy of it and goes and plunks it down 47 counties away on a completely different chromosome next to some other gene there. What have you just done? You have invented a completely novel gene, a gene that consists of all of the exons that that gene normally has with this thing plunked down right in the middle of it. So a transpositional event like that can invent entirely new proteins. Okay, that's not dissimilar from a mutation and the exon, all of that. But now, what if we take this one step further? Now instead, what the transposase has done, thanks to a mutation, is it makes a copy of a stretch of DNA that includes a promoter. And it now plunks this promoter down someplace else entirely. Has it now created a new gene? No way. Is this going to produce a new protein? No way. What will you have just invented? A new if-then clause. Because what we saw on Monday, what promoters are about are if-then clauses. If and only if this transcription factor is on the scene, that's the promoter part of the clause, then transcribe this gene. An if-then clause, if and only if we're running out of energy, ATP in this cell, then, thanks to that transcription factor, then upregulate, increase your expression of your glucose transporter gene. If and only if your testosterone receptor is doing its transcription factor thingy, then increase the size of your muscle cells. All these if-then relationships... What happens if you've got a transposase doing something totally novel and grabs a copy of some promoter and plunks it down someplace novel? You haven't made a new gene. You've made a new if-then clause. And this can suddenly make for very dramatic rapid changes. Okay, so let's look at some possible examples here. So we start off with our promoter and gene. And their perfectly normal relationship there, and that's the one we're accustomed to. And the if-then clause here is as follows. If it's dry out, in other words, if for whatever species you are, it's now the dry season. If it's dry out, then retain water. Okay, let's translate that into some sort of physiology. There's got to be signals detected in kidney cells which tell you about water availability, dehydration, all of that. There's got to be transcription factors that could be activated depending on the hydration state of some cell, some kidney cell. And the deal is if a particular transcription factor is activated because it's dry, suddenly the kidney does something or other different which makes it better at retaining water. Hooray! So that's how you go about being an uh, individual, a mammal, who's surviving during a dry season. We've got this if-then clause, and we know it's got to involve some sort of if and some sort of then. Now, instead, you've had some jumping gene transposase event so that this promoter has been copied, and it's plunked down in front of a completely different gene. So here's the if-then clause you just made. If it's dry, same exact signal, same if, same promoter-mediated events. If it's dry, then ovulate. Okay. (laughs) Sure, sounds good. What have you just invented by plunking down a promoter there? What does this if-then clause allow you to do? You've now gone from, if it's dry, retain water, to, in addition, this totally novel, bizarre thing you've just started doing, if it's dry then ovulate. 
what have you just invented? A really weird reproductive cycle or what? Okay, <laughs> what, what does your normal animal out there and assume like a normal world out there with climate oscillations and stuff? And so what have you just invented? So... First line here, I say to trying a different tack. So first line, okay, so it's the dry season. You live in some environment where there's a wet season, there's a dry season. It's the dry season, and some if-then thing winds up making your kidneys work better so that during the dry season you retain water. Now, thanks to this if-then mutation, you've invented a new if-then. If it's dry out, if it's the dry season, then you ovulate. Yeah, Yeah, seasonal mating. Seasonal mating. And suppose, okay, the dry season is six months before the wet season. Suppose you've got a six-month gestation period. Back in the old days before you had this, if you happen to ovulate during the rainy season, you're going to give birth right in the middle of the dry season. Bad news, your offspring have a much smaller chance of surviving. If you do all of your ovulating now during the dry season and give birth exclusively during the rainy season, suddenly pregnancies on the average are much more successful. What a cool innovation. Suddenly, thanks to the invention of seasonal mating, that could be much more optimal outcomes, much better offspring survival. Assuming, on the other hand, you're not a species where you've got a a two-and-a-half-hour gestation period, so, oh, no, dry period, and then you give... That would not be a very helpful mutation. Maybe then you would want to stick a, if it's wet, then ovulate. But what we see here mainly is by taking some hypothetical mutation-y sort of event and sticking this promoter onto a different then clause, we've just invented a completely different reproductive system. And there are various species that have differed, that have diverged, that have speciated based on time of year when they mate. So this could be a sort of thing that would drive speciation. Just one little old mutation in transposes and a macro, macro consequence. Okay, one complication here to keep in mind, which is where is this if-then clause playing out in the kidney? Where would this if-then clause be playing out in the hypothalamus or the pituitary or the ovaries or something like that? If we're going to start coming up with stories like this, we're going to have to factor in, like, you don't do your water retention in your nose, you don't do your ovulation in your big toe or your kidneys. You've got to have some cell-type-specific constraints. But the main thing is, by inventing a new if-then clause, if it's the right one, you have a massive consequence. Okay, let's have another example. So you've got an if clause from a transcription factor. If I am smelling a relative, if it's the right sort of relative, if it's one with a certain degree of relatedness, who also smells infantile, and as we'll see by later this next week when seeing how you recognize relatives, if this relative happens to, for example, smell like my vaginal fluids, that's probably someone I've recently given birth to. What a good idea, then, that I should... Okay. What you see, then, is... Um... That then that's coupled to a nursing thing. Okay, so your if clause, if you smell a relative pheromones that carry certain information, certain blah, 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 then you release a hormone that causes milk letdown. Good idea. Now, instead, you've got this jumping and inserted in a different place. If it's a relative, don't mate with them. You've just created incest avoidance, which is found in virtually every social species out there. Or, if it smells like a relative, plunk it upstream from the gene that says, cooperate with them. You've just invented kin selection. Again, this is idiotically simplistic, and there's no such if-then clauses like these in the real world. If you smell a relative, then let down milk. This is going on in the nose. This is going on in sort of breast uh, milk cells. This is going on in the nose. This is going on... Yeah, this is simplified, but nonetheless, you could see sudden dramatic consequence. Now, instead of sticking a promoter someplace novel, let's take the same gene and switch out promoters. That's the transpose event. 
So we start off here, and we've got an if-then clause, which is if you are secreting a lot of glucocorticoids. Okay, anyone who's ever been in any other class with me knows that I obsess over glucocorticoids. I am in love with these hormones. When you finish reading that zebra book, so will you too. These are stress hormones. They're secreted during stress. Back to the other day, how do these work? They are steroid hormones, same broad class as androgens, estrogen, progesterone, etc. They are steroid hormones, which means they enter target cells and bind to glucocorticoid receptors, and back to Monday, what is this now? It's a transcription factor, which goes and binds to a promoter that is responsive, a glucocorticoid response promoter. We know this whole deal by now. So along come glucocorticoids. We have an if clause, and we've just seen how that could be translated into a transcription factor. Glucocorticoid receptor goes to its promoter, and as a result, you suppress your immune system. That happens to be how it works you have stress-induced suppression of immune defenses. And if you're dealing with just a couple of days' worth of stress, that makes a great deal of sense. If you're dealing with chronic stress, that's in fact very bad news. A whole field, psychoneuroimmunology, is built around this relationship. Nuts and bolts of it. If clauses like this playing out in immune cells, then you suppress the immune system. Back to 10 minutes ago, what do glucocorticoids do in this domain? They shut down that transcription factor, NF kappa B. If you care about such things, if you don't, do not write it down. We just have an if-then clause. For certain reasons, this kind of makes sense that it works this way. If there are glucocorticoids around, then suppress immunity. So, now you've had a transposase event, and you've stuck in a different promoter upstream of the suppress immunity gene. Totally imaginary, obviously. You've stuck in a different promoter, a promoter which instead of being responsive to glucocorticoids is responsive to progesterone. Not all that outlandish. Progesterone is another steroid hormone. Same mechanism, progesterone working through its progesterone receptor goes and does this transcription factor thing. So now you've created a different if-then clause. If there's progesterone around, then suppress your immune system. What's up with that? Any speculations what this has just explained in physiology of humans and other mammals? If there is progesterone around, then suppress your immune system. Any ideas? Okay, what does progesterone do? Deconstruct its name. Wait, who said something? Pregnancy, okay, it is pro-gestational. So if there's progesterone around, suppress your immune system. What have you just invented? Something that's going to be wonderful for you passing on copies of your genes. Something that occurs during pregnancy. Yeah, you suppress your immune system. Okay, yes, you know that already. Why does that make sense to do? Yes. Oh, say it in unison. You don't want to pass the baby as like a foreign thing. Okay, is that what you were going to say? Yes, okay. You both shared a lottery prize. Exactly. That's this whole phenomenon. You got this, like, alien thing growing in you there that, like, half of its genes come from whoever that guy was, and he's moved along on, and he's probably, like, riddled you with these imprinted genes that are going to do in your uterine wall and toxic sperm and all of that, and, like... This thing's growing in you, and if your immune system is on the very jumpy side, you could wind up rejecting it. The whole business of pregnancy-induced immune suppression was a wonderful invention back when. There is a downside for it, which hopefully uh, not many of you will experience, but nonetheless it is fairly common. So what happens after the end of pregnancy? Your immune suppression ends and goes back to where it was. And what often happens is at that point, there's actually an overshoot. And during the post-parturition period, the period after giving birth, if you have a vulnerability to an autoimmune disorder, a disease of an overactive immune system that's inadvertently attacking a piece of you that is not supposed to attack, the post-parturition period is one of great vulnerability of autoimmune diseases either coming out of 
sort of relapsing back into it or being seen for the first time, this suppression, if it happens to overshoot. Okay, so this is this wonderful invention here, which is suppress immune defenses. Don't inadvertently reject your fetus. Great thing to do. How could you have invented that by something like this occurring? Yeah, question. Ah, okay. Okay, good. Great question. Question being, okay, if I had already brought up this horrifying possibility that the promoter could be like in your great aunt and is still affecting what's going on in this gene there, if promoters could be at great distances, who needs to invoke something about promoters being moved around? Yes, that one's kind of a horrifying circus trick. The vast majority of promoters instead are very, very local, just upstream. This is something quite rare. So if you could move a promoter that might be having an influence four miles away and instead put it down just upstream from the gene, it's much more likely to be having an effect. Great question, but that's the much more common picture. I just told you that to show off. But yes, that does happen now and then. Okay, so what are you doing here? These are dramatic changes. You are not changing any single protein here. Protein having to do with nursing. Protein have it. You're not changing any proteins. You're not changing any genes. You're totally changing the context. You are changing your if-then clauses, and this is a world of difference away from, ooh, my benzodiazepine receptor is slightly different shape than yours, and thus a slightly different tendency towards anxiety, and thus a slightly different trajectory in this. Instead, what are we beginning to see with all of these circumstances here, these are possibilities of big macroevolutionary changes. So what we see is lots of molecular means by which you can start doing stuff like this. Massive, massive changes. Okay, one additional domain that translates out into macro changes. So we've already seen the possibility that you can have multiple copies of the same promoter. Not just multiple copies in front of 400 other genes, but in front of any given gene, you can have multiple copies of the same promoter. More copies, what that tends to translate out into is more reading off of this gene. Now, sometimes, due to all sorts of events built around probably stuff like this, other mistakes in DNA replication, now you can also get multiple copies of a gene itself. Now you can get, oh, hell, why doesn't I say the same thing? Now you can actually get multiple copies of a gene itself. I say a second time, you can get, I'm not going to say it again, you now have this whole additional realm of what is called copy number variance, which is the genetic difference between two individuals isn't in the gene, isn't in the DNA sequence of the gene, isn't in the promoter of it, isn't anything like that. But one individual has two copies of the gene right after each other, and the other has only one copy. And that begins to have implications as well. There's a whole literature emerging by now looking at schizophrenia and showing that there's a bunch of genes in schizophrenics that have weird multiple copy variants compared to everybody else. Most people will have X number of copies of this particular gene. Schizophrenics tend to have more or less whatever. Nobody has a clue what this means, but some of the best evidence about the genetics of schizophrenia right now is not mutations in any genes, but variation in the number of copies of some genes. So that looks kind of interesting. Then you could see something else. So... Thanks to one of these sorts of events or whatever, you now have two copies of this gene. And what you begin to see is, suppose it codes for a protein that's absolutely essential for life. So you make copies of these protein, this protein, thanks to those two. But you have two copies of the gene. You've got a safety net. You can have some mutation that takes one of these out of action, and you've got a fallback plan. That appears to be the case, a gene that's very pertinent to Alzheimer's disease, something called the amyloid precursor protein. There seems to be a duplicate of it, which in some people seems to offer some protection against whatever goes wrong. Okay, so you can have a second copy, which allows you to have a safety net. You've backed up your system, your hard drive. 
you can have a third possibility. So now suppose this is coding for some critical protein, and you make enough of that protein off of this gene that you're just fine. What's that allow you to do? This gene can begin to drift. This gene could begin to accrue mutations over generations where it doesn't matter if it does something it can't make this protein anymore. You're safe with this. This one begins to drift, and this gives you the opportunity to come up with a completely novel gene. This gives you some extra space for experimenting. And when you look at, say, all those steroid hormones, structurally we'll wind up seeing estrogen is really structurally close to progesterone, which is close to androgens, close to glucocorticoids. Their receptors are very similar to each other. What people have shown is ancestrally there was only one gene for a steroid hormone receptor, and it has many copies, and thanks to one of them being maintained due to negative selection, as we heard about on Monday, conservative selection, do not let anything change in this one. Let this one drift evolutionarily, that's how we wound up inventing genes for different types of receptors for very similar hormones. So this gene duplication process, another macro level where you can get major changes going on. Okay, so what we've seen now are lots of different ways to get rapid change. Rapid change, even from the standpoint of like biologists as opposed to fossil people, you can have very rapid stuff happening through this whole world. So we've explained half of the possibility of punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated. But what about the equilibrium? How do you explain, according to their model, how you can go long, long, long periods with nothing changing at all? And the answer is the exact same stuff that explains the punctuated part. Back to any one of these. Okay. You've had a mutation in this exon. This exon, which thanks to this gene having 11D different exons, you can now produce exponentially 11D squared, whatever, proteins, all of that. You have a change in this one exon, and as we we already saw, you could now change, create four entirely new proteins. What are the odds that all four of those new proteins, that none of them are going to do anything disastrous to you? You have a mutation and a promoter. And as a result, you have created an entirely new gene transcription network. What are the odds that this everything in this new network is going to work wonderfully for you and that you won't have now somehow gotten a network that puts your foot on the gas and the brake at the same time? What if you've had a mutation in a transcription factor and as a result, you've invented 11 new types of networks. What are the odds of having any little micro change that has massive consequences amplified and none of those changes not being a disaster? If you're changing stuff in entire networks, the odds are that one of those changes is going to wind up doing you in when you have changes that have big, big macro consequences that are amplified throughout networks, the odds are most of those changes are going to be disasters, that at least one piece of the change is going to be bad news. In other words, most of the changes, and you're going to go off the edge of a cliff. Most of the time, changes that wind up having amplified macro implications are not going to have you leaving more copies of your genes. What are the odds are of changing something in 27 different proteins of yours, and at least one of them is good news, and all the rest are at least neutral? That's totally unlikely. That's like throwing cards in the air and expecting them to land and look like who knows what. What are the odds? So what you see is once you start dealing with the world of amplified macro mutational consequences, most of those are disasters. Most of the time, there is selection for nothing changing at all. Most of the time, there is vast conservatism because it's very hard to come up with a change that's not going to be a mess. So what we're barreling towards now is maybe we can never even find the punctuated half of it. Maybe it's always going to be equilibrium. How does change ever occur? And here's where we get another concept in the field, which is every now and then you get some circumstance that is some environmental shift, some something or other, some circumstance that is so extreme, that is so awful, that is so challenging, that is so whatever, that the basic rule is if you have this one trait, 
you're going to survive, and it really doesn't matter what else is in your genome, and if you don't have that trait, you're not going to survive, and only 1% of the population survives, where there's a massive die-off, and one single trait makes the difference, what would be called an evolutionary bottleneck. When there is some crisis that wipes out most of a species, and it's just a very small number of attributes that determine the small subset that survives. What do you have in a case like that? Okay, here's a circumstance where you've had some change in this one exon, and what it does is it produces changes in 400 different proteins, and three of them wind up being somewhat useful. Most of them are completely neutral. Two or three are very deleterious. But along comes one of these bottleneck circumstances. And forget what's going on in the 399 other proteins. Just having in one protein, having this version, that's the thing that allows you to survive. That's where you suddenly see the very rapid change. So what you get here is a totally different picture than the gradualism going on from Monday and from last week. Here we have instead, because most genetic changes wind up having these big amplifying effects. Most of them are bad news. Most of them are selected against long periods of stasis until you get some extreme selective circumstance where only a tiny subset of individuals with one particular trait wind up coming through the other end. Let me give you an example of what the bottleneck stuff looks like. Cheetahs. Cheetahs, there are not a whole lot of cheetahs left on Earth. And as far as people can reconstruct, about 10,000 years ago, there was a massive, massive something or other catastrophe that happened to cheetahs, maybe some disease, maybe who knows what, an evolutionarily selective bottleneck where who knows what percentage of cheetahs died, but like 99.99% of them, there was just only a tiny remnant population of cheetahs that survived. And 10,000 years later, all the cheetahs on Earth are descendants of that one very small population. How can you tell? Essentially, all cheetahs are close to genetically identical. You can take a skin graft from any cheetah, a cheetah from you know, the bottom of South Africa, and graft it onto a cheetah from North Africa, and it won't be rejected. There's astonishing genetic similarity, lack of variability in cheetahs, because we're seeing a species that's just come out the other end of some selective bottleneck. Nobody knows what that bottleneck was, and it was something like five to 10,000 years ago. Nobody knows what the trait was that allowed the handful to survive, but whatever that trait was, it caused a very rapid selective change. That's what a bottleneck would look like. And there's considerable evidence that humans, hominid ancestors, have gone through a number of selective bottlenecks where the entire human population has dwindled down to less than 100,000 at a couple of points 50,000 years ago. Who knows what that sort of thing. So you get these selective bottlenecks. That's where the change occurs. Okay, so we've got these entirely two different worldviews here. We see molecular mechanisms for both. We have molecular mechanisms that suggest that if this is how it works, there's no way this can. Yet there's evidence that this does occur sometimes. So how do we begin to reconcile gradualist microevolutionary change models with much more dramatic macro ones? How do you begin to put the pieces together? Okay, so we see the themes of this. Microevolutionary changes, gradualist ones, are about changes in the function of pre existing proteins. Changes in how well the protein does its normal, boring old thing. Macro changes are about inventing novel proteins, novel usages, novel networks, novel if then clauses. So, two very, very different levels of changes occurring. So the immediate middle of the road, can't we all get along and be friends view is, so maybe there's some micro and macro stuff going on at the same time. Let me give you an example of this. Again, comparing the genomes between humans and chimps, looking at where the genes are that differ, and looking at in what ways do they differ. Is there evidence of major dramatic shifts in time when the two genes diverged? Are they actually divergencies in the genes or in promoters, the transcription factors, all of those macrotype issues there? And what you see when you compare the genomes, the genes that differ between humans and chimps related to immune function 
most of those tend to be little microevolutionary changes. Most of those are involving small changes in how particular immune-related proteins work. When you look at the genetic differences related to development, most of those are more macro network if-then clause differences. So we could see here two different types of change were going on in humans and chimps simultaneously as they diverged. It's not just one model or the other. Next, is there evidence for gradualism in the fossil record? Absolutely. There are some fossil records, histories, where you do see gradualism. The majority of them, instead, you see punctuated models, and we know exactly how to critique that. Ooh, fossils, that's the boring stuff. But there are some fossil records that show gradualism. So, next question. In terms of evaluating the possibilities of this, just how fast can gene frequencies change in a population? Or stated another way, just how fast can evolution occur? And evolution happens in lifetimes of us in real time. Evolution has been observed, has been documented. We've heard one example of this already, which was the other day, which is antibiotic resistance in bacteria. That has been extremely rapid evolution and one with massive potential consequences. Yeah, evolution can occur fast there. Some other examples. Okay, how many of you know the example about these Siberian foxes that have been bred for their tameness? Okay, totally cool example. Incredibly cool story. Okay, so there's Siberian foxes. And being Siberian foxes, they do fox-like behaviors, and you wouldn't want to have them as a pet, and they would probably eat your child if you turned your back on them. And for decades and decades, there's been this one lone, maddened, obsessive Soviet geneticist, often some like Siberian Research Institute for God knows what crime. And what he's been doing all these decades, actually by now I think it's his great-grandchildren who are doing it, is they've been breeding Siberian foxes. They've been breeding them for a certain trait, And the trait is to be tame, to be easily approached by humans. And the first couple of generations worth of this, these were the captive, the ones they had captured, and the ones who, instead of going to the furthest end of the pen, went like two feet from the furthest end of the pen. Let those be the ones to reproduce. Then by the next generation, some of them would only like go near the back corner of the pen. And slowly over the course of 35 generations, what this person was able to do was breed tame foxes. Foxes who were perfectly comfortable being around humans, all of that. Something astonishing was found in the process. And go back tonight and look up on Wikipedia or Google Images or something, looking for tamed Siberian foxes, and you will see something astonishing. All these guys were breeding for was a behavioral trait. Tameness. And after 35 generations, look at a picture of what these foxes look like, and they look like puppies. They look like puppies. Their muzzles have gotten shorter. They've gotten these cute, roundy little foreheads. They've gotten patches on them that make them look like do- that look like Dalmatians or whatever. They've gotten curly little tails that they wag. These foxes wag their tails. Incredible finding, which is basically implying if you want to breed a wild animal like that, a a social carnivore like that, and you want to breed it to start liking being around humans, essentially what you're breeding it for is never growing up, being like a dependent baby, which is essentially what dogs are when compared to their wolf ancestors. You're breeding them, and suddenly they get all these baby features, and their muzzles get short, and they get all stubby limbs, and they're adorable. You cannot believe how cute these things are, and they look just like puppies, and they have started doing things like barking and they wag their tails and they'll bring your Siberian slippers for you and all sorts of stuff like that. It tells you this fascinating thing about the coupling between physical traits and behavioral traits, but the main point is it took only 35 generations of breeding to get these things to look like puppies. That's fast. Meanwhile, a converse phenomenon going on in the ex-Soviet Union as well, which is this phenomenon called the Moscow Metro Dogs. Has anybody heard of that? Okay, handful. 
there have apparently just been abandoned dogs in Moscow for centuries and centuries, and in some weird deal there that nobody seems to understand, a subset of them have figured out how to get on the subway system and ride on the subway line to various locations, and you will see pictures of like commuters there, and there's just the dog sitting there on its usual seat, and it's there every day, but these are feral dogs by now, these are wild dogs, and there's 20,000 or so wild dogs in Moscow, abandoned ones, not abandoned and by its owners, but the great, great, great descendants, multiple generations now of dogs that were abandoned. In other words, dogs that are 10, 20 generations into living in packs on their own on the streets of Moscow. In other words, dogs who have been surviving and reproducing based on the extreme selective pressure of no longer acting like Fido, who you're convinced can understand you and can add numbers and stuff, but instead are having to do sort of pack-like behaviors and survive as carnivores, and the Moscow Street Metro dogs are beginning to look more and more like wolves. Their muzzles are getting longer. Their tails are straightening. They don't wag their tails. They have lost all the distinctive coat patterns of different... And they're all beginning to get the same sort of gray wolf sort of coats there. And it's only taken a century or so. And these guys are beginning to look more and more like wolves. So rapid stuff. More examples of this for reasons that are utterly mysterious. About 150 years ago, there was some naturalist in Chicago who was obsessed with catching rodents there and taxiderming them and preserving their pelts and their skins and all of that, which 150 years later has allowed scientists to look at the genetic profile of Chicago rats back then versus now, and there have been speciation events. Over 150 years or so, evolution has moved that quickly. We will hear another example of that when we look at the evolution of westernized diet, and suddenly when people start eating like westernized people, they start getting diabetes out like crazy and start killing people at age 25 or 30, and it takes only three or four generations to start getting the metabolisms that all of us have, which means we can eat westernized diets and not keel over after a quarter century. Evolution of metabolism is occurring in humans in three or four generations. So there's plenty of precedent for evolution occurring in real time really rapidly. So that winds up being a vote for punctuated models. How about is there evidence in real time for gradualist change occurring? By definition, you can't see evidence for it because it's gradual. If you could have a 10,000-year experiment, maybe then we'll talk. There's no active, ongoing evidence of gradualistic change because it's virtually impossible to spot. Okay, so what do we see over and over here? It's a, why can't we all get along? And here's a final version why that may be the case. Okay, but that's not going to do it. Okay, so suppose we've got some trait here, which over time, in fact, is showing a punctuated profile of some particular trait related to something or other. And meanwhile, there's another trait which is also showing a punctuated pattern, and it's doing something like this, and that's what it's been doing over the last 100,000 years. And meanwhile, there's another trait that's doing this, and oh, it can't go in that direction. And that's it. And what happens when you put all the pieces together? You get gradualism. And maybe what you're seeing is the more you focus on individual traits, the more you see the evolution going on in punctuated manners, the more you see assemblages of whole bunches of traits, the more it merges into a gradualist picture. And what we will be looking at over and over again are some of the most multigenic traits out there having to do with behavior. Okay, so what have we gotten to at this point? A mere 30 minutes before we're supposed to stop. Yes, good news, we're just about done. So what have we gotten to? We have now shifted one bucket into looking at how molecular geneticists think about the evolution of behavior. What are the big points to take home from this? Number one, that there are absolutely classical molecular models to explain gradualist change. Number two, all the cool novel stuff, the world of promoters, exons, introns, all of that, what that provides for are plenty of ways in which macro changes could be occurring as well. 
Likewise, not only does that provide for mechanisms to exp explain rapid punctuated change, it also de facto explains why you would be getting long periods of stasis if you're getting minor mutational changes amplified into huge network consequences. Most of the time, it's not going to be a good idea. Biggest theme, though, running through all of it is one that's now going to come up even more so in the coming lectures, which is, and don't be overly impressed with genes knowing what they're doing, over and over the regulation of genes, absolutely meaningless outside the context of environmental regulation. What that now has us poised to do is to switch to our next bucket for the next two lectures or so, and what that will be is a completely different field called behavior genetics. And this is people trying to understand what genes have to do with behavior, not by doing a, over the course of evolution, an individual left more copies of their genes for this trade and maximize this or that story of last week. Not people doing, ooh, here's a promoter related to this gene, but instead this is the world of people looking at patterns of shared behavior between twins, identical versus dizygotic, looking at patterns of adoption traits that are shared with biological parents versus adoptive parents. And as we will see, this is the most contentious field bucket that we will have looked at so far. Hugely, hugely controversial studies built around, well, just how much are they showing traits to be inherited? Okay, so we will pick up on that on Friday with our new bucket.